Dr. Simmons, thank you for allowing us to interview you. Can you tell us something about your interest in snoring and sleep apnea? Well, from a personal aspect, I'm a terrible snorer. So snoring has always been something that I've tried to figure out how to deal with. And um, it started off when I was in my uh, 30s that I started to snore with some significance. Prior to that, it wasn't an issue. So when I got tested for my snoring, it turned out that I don't just have simple snoring, I have sleep apnea. Now somewhere along the way, between not snoring, snoring gently and having sleep apnea, I went from somebody that didn't have a problem to somebody that really has to address it. So from a personal point of view, I now have snoring that is just a sort of a telltale sign of something more serious. And that is the thing that sort of struck my interest in helping people that have snoring. The first thing, of course, is it's a social problem. If you're uh, sharing a bed with somebody and you snore, neither you, the snorer, nor your bed partner is going to get good sleep. So it's kind of an important thing from a social point of view, even if it's just a benign snoring. But uh, unfortunately, about half the people that snore, maybe a little less than half, they have sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is no joke. They have a lot of consequences patients do typically when they have sleep apnea. There can be consequences such as high blood pressure, cardiovascular problems, strokes. Some people that have um, uh, sleep apnea have issues with uh, glucose intolerance, diabetes, they have reflux, depression. For men it's important they have impotence, that's very important to men, and also issues with brain damage. So there's a lot of things that happen when you have sleep apnea. And certainly, if it's just snoring, it's still nicer for your bed partner if you don't snore. So benign snoring is something that I still think is important to address. But certainly my point is, if you can catch snoring early on, perhaps you can prevent it progressing to more serious stuff like sleep apnea. It's interesting that you said that. I'm a man and I snore and I was, I was wondering if it's a problem for me. Well, first of all, it's a social issue as a minimum issue. So you could look at it from that perspective. But unless you're tested, we don't know if the snoring is benign or if it's more significant. So just consider that you've got a 50-50 chance, if you're snoring, of it being sleep apnea. And if you snore loudly, or you snore nearly every day, every night, when you go to sleep, that's much more likely to be sleep apnea. In fact, if somebody can hear you in the room next door, chances are you have sleep apnea. And I've heard all sorts of tales about people hearing it in the room next door or the house next door. Likely the people that snore the loudest do have sleep apnea. And in fact, the person that has the loudest snoring in the Guinness Book of Records, he has sleep apnea. So it depends on that. How loud, how frequently do you snore? Secondly, I would say to you, do you have any symptoms that are typical of people that have sleep apnea? Do you have any high blood pressure? Is it creeping up? Are you managing your high blood pressure on one medicine and then having to go to two medicines and then three medicines? Do you have any other issues going on where you just don't feel rested in the, in the day? So you sleep at night and you wake up in the morning and you go, gosh, I, I, I was in bed for seven hours or eight hours, I just don't feel rested. And you have to take naps during the day and you're drowsy when you drive. These are indicators that you're not getting good sleep. So even though you're in bed for that many hours, that snoring may be an indicator of you waking up because you have problems breathing and you're waking up in order to restore tone or muscle activity in your airway so that you can breathe. So for instance, some people will snore very gently. It's just a gentle snoring. Some people snore more pronounced. And you can feel like when they're snoring, they're not getting all the air in. It's and you go, well, what's going on? Are they getting enough oxygen into their bloodstream? And that's one of the things that's measured in a sleep study. And then there's people that actually have lapses in their breathing. So you say you're snoring, but then I would ask you a little bit more, and I would say, well, is it loud? Is it frequent? And is it associated with lapses? So here's an example of lapsing. You're snoring away, and then it's... So there's a lapse. Now, if there's a lapse of 10 seconds or more, that's called an apnea. That's an event. And when you have a sleep study, it measures those events. The times that you stop sleep, uh, you stop breathing because you're snoring or you're snorting or you're gasping for air. And when you also, it, it counts 
not only those apneas, those events of 10 seconds or more without breathing, but they also count what's called hypopneas. And a hypopnea is not that you stop breathing, but your breathing is so restricted that the oxygen level is going down in your bloodstream. And it's a problem because if your oxygen drops in your bloodstream, your blood vessels change. They become damaged. They become atherosclerotic. You develop high blood pressure. And one thing leads to another and leads to another. So snoring in of itself, I don't know. We'd need to test you. And certainly if you came to a dentist such as myself that's trained in treating people with snoring, I would say to you, before I can treat you, I have to have a test done on you. So I would have your physician get a test, or I would enable you to have a test, and then the results will be read by a medical sleep specialist and interpreted. And if it's the interpretation is, no, you don't have oxygen levels dropping in your bloodstream, no, you don't have any apneic events of significance, because you're allowed to have a few. It's just you're not allowed to have more than five every hour. So we're going to measure them in these sleep studies, and we're going to quantify and average over the whole sleep cycle how many times did you have those lapses? How many times did you have an apnea? How many times did you have a hypopnea? And we're going to find out and give you a number. It's on an index, an apnea and hypopnea index. And based upon that, we're going to decide, do you need to be treated because you have sleep apnea? Or is it a social issue and we want to treat your snoring so that you have a happy spouse or happy bed partner? Uh, why would the dentist be involved in sleep apnea? Uh, well, sleep apnea can be treated by several approaches. Uh, the most common approach, and often the first approach, not necessarily the best one, is the breathing machine. The breathing machine works quite nicely if someone can tolerate wearing it. Unfortunately, about half the people that get these breathing machines aren't able to wear it. For, for no um, cause other than perhaps it makes them feel claustrophobic, or it's just so uncomfortable, or they move around a lot in their sleep. Let me give you an example. This is one of the breathing machines. This is as simple as it gets. It's nice and small and compact. This is the tube that connects to the breathing machine. And you connect to the breathing machine this way. And that seems very straightforward. And then you have to connect the machine with some electricity. And this connects to the wall. And that works quite nicely. For a lot of people, they can wear it. Unfortunately, if you travel a lot, that's a lot to carry around. The other thing is if you like to camp or hike, it's certainly not something that you can just plug in on the outdoors. Unfortunately, it's not the only thing that people need. Sometimes they get their mouth so dried out from wearing the breathing machine that they need to have a second piece called a humidifier. And you put water in the humidifier and it clicks together nicely and it works again and you plug it in. And again, it can work very, very beautifully. It can be very neat and comfortable for people when they're going to sleep. It can fit like this and they breathe nicely and it can help. The unfortunate thing about it is if you have to get up in the night to go to the bathroom, you have to unplug or disconnect and switch off the machine. It's a very good answer, but it's cumbersome. It's kind of a, a difficult thing to adapt to and it's a lot to carry around, especially if you're traveling. Here's the comparison. This is the treatment with a mouthpiece. And you can see the difference. This is all I need. This is my carrying case. And I take it with me like this. That's the reason why dentists are involved. This is a treatment the patients prefer. It's not the best treatment. In some circumstances, it should be the first treatment. For instance, if you have very mild sleep apnea or moderate sleep apnea, it should be considered as a first-line therapy. If it's something that you have very severe sleep apnea, the breathing machine is usually much more reliable. However, if you're not going to wear the breathing machine, you're going to continue to have terrible problems, most likely, if you continue to have sleep apnea. So rather than do nothing, it's recommended that you wear a mouthpiece or try to wear a mouthpiece. Now there is a third option. We've talked about the breathing machine, we've spoken about a mouthpiece, the third option is a surgery. And there are different types of surgeons that can do a surgery. Sometimes it's a soft tissue surgery that's done by ear, nose, and throat doctors. And sometimes it's a hard bone surgery to move the jaws forward, and that's done by a maxillofacial surgeon. So in my particular case, with my snoring and sleep apnea, I prefer the mouthpiece. When I travel, I use the mouthpiece. Do I have a breathing machine? Yes. Do I use it sometimes? Yes. Why don't I use it every time? 
It's just cumbersome and it's more difficult. Why would I use it at all? Sometimes I feel like I can get better restful sleep. Perhaps I have a little congestion. Perhaps I have other issues going on where I can't use the mouthpiece. I have a mouth sore and then I'll have the, the backup with the breathing machine. I have moderate sleep apnea. It's not that severe that I would want to use both things every night. Can any dentist do this? Uh, any dentist is licensed to provide a mouthpiece. They can provide a mouthpiece for snoring and sleep apnea. They should not provide a mouthpiece until the patient has been tested. This can be a mistake because the dentist is very well meaning and wants to treat the snoring, but unless the snoring is being checked, you don't know that the mouthpiece is addressing the right thing. Some mouthpieces are made for snoring, and that doesn't really mean they're approved for treating sleep apnea. Now, how do you know somebody is qualified? And uh, I would say that you should look on the website of the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. If you can find somebody that is a diplomat of the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Facial Pain, somebody that has a certificate such as this, which is an accreditation certificate, from the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. There are a few places now and they're beginning to get more and more around the United States. Unfortunately, in California, there are only three places. So um, uh, it's gonna be a few years probably before enough accredited sites are available to uh, service all the major cities. So somebody that's accredited or a director of an accredited dental sleep medicine center, somebody that has um, diplomacy in one of those uh, major dental academies that, that are devoted towards oral facial pain or oral dysfunctional things or dental sleep medicine or you could ask your dentist how many of these things have you done are you very seasoned in it if they do one or two a year that's not really enough to become proficient so i would ask them what's their experience perhaps you could ask them to speak to some of the patients that they've treated and make sure the patients are happy why an accredited dental sleep medicine facility is good is because they have to fulfill certain criteria to maintain their accredited, accredited status. So those people are sort of the best people or best facilities if, if they're available. But that doesn't mean you don't get treated by a dentist. There are a lot of very talented dentists. Just make sure you're going to somebody that really has the experience and background and training to really take care of you.